time. Are you also excited? If you're excited, give yourself a big hands of applause. Yeah. Girl power, right? Yeah. I'm very excited to be here, honestly. And I'd like to first and foremost uh, extend my appreciation to Girl Up Team, to Let Girls Lead for the invitation. Um, I, I can promise you I'm not gonna bore you here today because me too, it's easier to get bored, right? And if you're excited, right, to change the world, you are in the right place. Who's not excited to change the world? Everyone is. If you are, give yourself a big hand of applause again. Great. Thank you. So today, um, as you heard the introduction, my name is Kula, right? I'm from Liberia. How many of you have heard of Liberia? Great. Uh, so that makes my job easier. So uh, Liberia is a country in West Africa very tiny, of a population of 3.5 billion people, but with a lot of challenges. As you listen to the introduction earlier, um, my breath into the world was introduced to crisis. So imagine a two-year-old getting forgotten on a farm in her county, and after a sudden, and then they came and grabbed me back, we had connected after like 30 minutes, and that was the beginning of running around, being a refugee, being a displaced many times in many years. It was very recently when Liberia elected the first woman president in 2005, President Early Johnson Sirleaf, when the country started to see a semblance of peace where people can finally go to bed. Um, but before that, it was a challenging time for me. As a young woman in the country, who parent were basically not very rich, but not very poor, kind of in the middle class. And then out of a sudden, everything is ripped off. We end up living in refugee camps, going to school sometimes, sometimes not. Going home or staying without food many, many days. You know, there's something in Liberia, I mean, all of us know the dog, right? But there's something in Liberia called school feed dog. Like, you have to pay tuition to schools. And certain times when you and your colleagues are all in school, all of you are in school, I would assume. And out of a sudden, you don't see your friend, and then you ask, you say, oh, school feed dog bit that girl. That meant um, your parents weren't able to afford the tuition, so you were asked to leave the classroom. So we had to go through that many days. And conditions on refugee camps, really, really challenging. Because refugees live at the mercy of the United Nations. Um, like, so they have to send ration every month. Sometimes they don't come for months. And imagine how you want to eat. And I remember my mom, um, we walked long hours to go looking for food. So during refugee time, we had this form of barter system where if you have salt, you go and exchange it for maybe a potato. If you have Maggie cube, you can exchange that and get maybe fish. So that was the kind of life we lived for many, many years. And going to Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, a next door country, life was also a challenging one, going to refugee school. But all through the years that we were going through those struggles and those hustles, uh, God first, family second, the quest for education has always been paramount. So we attended refugee schools. Some days you don't even have uniforms. You go to school without shoes, but yet still, our eyes were set on the goals. But there were many, many girls like my age or younger than me couldn't afford that. Um, there were many girls and even boys who couldn't go to school. In fact, boys, young children were taken from their parents and sent on the war front to go and fight, you know? Boys were used to go and kill their own families and sometimes you'll see, they'll tell you, 
you see young children, young boys and girls, girls sexually molested during crisis. And we all saw those different things. As a young child, all of our childhood was raped off like we don't even know what it is to grow up, what it is to play as a child. If you are running from one place to the other and looking pictures or even seeing real dead bodies in the street, why, would I, why should I do that? Why should I be raped off of that childhood? Seeing people head chop off, hands, feet, laying in the streets. It was really, really some of the toughest time of growing up. But then coming out of all those traumatic period and seeing where I am, went to school, graduated, tried to ensure that I, because we were in a society, or we still, I'm sure, in a society where being a woman is twice as harder. And even if you are competent, you can be the smartest, but your female gender degrades you. So it was always as if, if you are a girl, you are not supposed to be the top of the class. You are not supposed to be good at mathematics. You are not supposed to be good at the sciences. You are not supposed to be good at being the head of the school or the valedictorian. But because we were grown like to be able to live with those myths, and I told myself I'm going to challenge that. Why will, why will society think that I'm not supposed to do? And the, the other thing that couldn't add up for me was that a boy and a girl will go to the same school, wear the same uniform color, for example. The only difference will be the boy will wear the pants and the girls will wear the skirt. Why, and we have the same teacher, there's no extra, and then why won't a girl be given that opportunity to do whatever she can do? And I said, I'm gonna challenge that. And I studied harder, got the best, mathematics grade, chemistry, all the sciences, and I became valedictorian of the school, and I was elected as student council president of my high school. <laughs> so, so for me, it was questioning the status quo and saying that I can do it because there's nothing different. If I can do it, everyone can do it. The girls here can do it. Girls across the world can do it. And leaving the high school, going to college, it was also a tough time in 2005 when young girls, sometimes you see, it's so exciting when you start a school year, right? Everybody gets excited, oh, it's so it's exciting, we don't want to start a school year, and you know, you get your booty, you find new friends, you want to hang out, and stuff like that. So we end up, when you have all your colleagues together, and a few girls at a time in the university, so that we start all at, at freshmen, at uh, first year student, and then when they go up to uh, sophomore, junior, before reaching junior, a lot of girls drop out of school. Like, you, oh, myself and Teresa were in the same class, but what happened? So a few girls then thought to find out what was the reason why girls were dropping out of school. And then they said, okay, to find out a lot of reasons, but one of the major ones was because of financial challenges. Tuition in Africa in Liberia is very cheap, very, very inexpensive, but yet still families can't afford that. Our families can afford it. So girls drop out of school, sometimes because of the burden. So if you're a girl, you have to be like your mom assistant. You take care of the home, uh, take care of dishes, take care of food, take care of little ones, and do a lot of household chores. And then your brother, well, he's done school. He has to go on a football field, go play whatever he wants to do, and comes home. So it becomes a lot of burden to be able to compete and be able to study harder, to do well in school, versus coming to taking care of your younger ones and doing the household chores. And then, this, in fact, the teachers, teachers asking students for grades, sex for grades, or like rampant in schools. So if a young girl cannot cope with whatever happening at home and coming, obviously there will be too much for her and she has to drop out. So that was one of the reasons why girls were dropping out. So at the end of the day, the young girls then thought to form an organization. And they said, we have found out like what was the problem? The problem, girls dropping out of school. We don't care what's happening, like, like international, whatever. Let's do 
do something in our community, in our neighbor, in our high school. And they decided to form an organization called the Paramount Young Men Initiative. The organization to be able to help, it started at a university campus uh, based uh, organization where to do different activities to raise funds, like do car washes, um, run and races, you know, do different, different activities and to get money to be able to pay tuition of other girls to stay in school. But if you are in university, you are ways a lot of step ahead of the people in high school. And because of the challenges girls face in communities in high school, we thought to relaunch the organization and work with girls in high schools, work with girls in community, communities that are very hard to reach, communities where, in fact, girls can't even afford. One time we started, when we started our scholarship program, we started vetting for um, needed students. And some of, we actually had resources for only 50 students. And we got applications for almost 500. So imagine the gap, the need was so high. And if you hear some of the stories, 50 just like very tiny, but the stories of some people can't even afford, the story of single mothers, story of girls who would drop out of school, um, rape victims. You know, so it was so like that. And, and because of the fire that was in us that we have to change our community, we have to contribute to ensuring that girls go to school, we thought to do that. And today, the Parma Young Men Initiative works to empower and educate young men and girls, and we do advocacy. And this is like home for me, <laughs> like working on leadership summit, going in the communities, getting, I mean, getting advocates and inspiring. This is like home for me, and I'm really, really excited to be here seeing all of you guys and being involved, but it's important as we all come from different communities, as we all come from different areas, the need and the challenges is enormous. There's one president that uh, of the United States that everybody loves. I do love him because of his brilliant quote that he's made in his worldwide that Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I'm sure you've heard that, right? Yeah. yeah, great, President Kennedy. So it is important to ask ourselves, what can we do for our communities? What can we do? And if you see something, do something about it. There's a famous people who go in the subway here. There's a famous code you see with the uh, stuff. See something, say something, right? So if you see something, do something about it. Let's work to change the world. Let's change our communities. Let's advocate. It was very difficult because for us, if we had institutions like Gird Up Initiative, it would have been amazing. So you guys are really blessed to have an institution to help guide you, to help support you. It's important to see that and say we're gonna do something about it. We're gonna do something about it. And the amazing work you do, advocating changing laws, changing policies, it's tough. Because if people are used to status quo, people are used to doing things a certain way, obviously it's a difficult thing to ensuring that girls get educated, girls are start being molested, like in places, girls get married, like some of the program that you all support here, uh, the Girl Up Initiative in Liberia. We've worked with uh, the U United Nations uh, organizations in Liberia. It's incredible when you see your colleague, somebody who's supposed to be in school, is already a mother and, I mean, it's, it's, it's like when going through the Sunday society, the traditional practices. Um, yeah, it's really very emotional when you see girls as young as 11, 12, 13, they forcibly getting married. And parents see that as a status quo. And even though we have the first female president of Africa, but it's really something that we all have to move. So wherever you are today, as you stay, the remaining course of this leadership summit, it is important to think and find the power in you 
all of us have the powers in us. All of us has that stuff that just get you kicking. It will be challenging, I can tell you, you can ask Melissa, you can ask the rest of the other team. It's never easy. There will be a lot of no's, there will be a lot of those that will be shot in your face, but let those moments serve as motivation. Let me just close by giving you a very short story. It was the story of this uh, boy. He said, you know, we, we like to think, as young people, we like to think that we are smarter than the older folks, right? So he went, he had this little bird. You know, they, they have this very tiny bird that you can see them all in the grass. So when you grab the bird, I mean, it's, there's a possibility of you holding the bird and it, will, it can live or either die. You know, it's that tiny that you can actually cover the bird with your hand. So he, because this old man in the community, people say he was the smartest. The young man thinks that he's the smartest. He said, I'm going to outsmart this guy. So he went and cut the little bird. He said he was going to go to the old man and then ask the old man if this bird was alive or the bird was dead. So if the old man had told him that the bird was alive, he would squeeze the bird and the bird would die and he would say, look, I'm the smartest, the bird is dead. But if the old man said the bird is dead, he will open his hands and the bird will fly away and he will still ask my the old man and say the bird is alive. So he took the bird and went, he was so excited in his head, that yes, I'm going to be the smartest. And then he went to the old man. He said, I have a bird in my hand. Tell me whether this bird is alive or the bird is dead. The old man looks at him for a long time and says, my son, the life of that bird is in your hands. You can decide to let it go, or you can decide to kill it. So I'll end by saying the life of the advocacy, of the movement, is in all of our hands. We can all decide to let the advocacy grow, or we can decide to let this movement die. And I'm sure with the zest and the power in this room, I can be assured that the advocacy will never die, right? And they're going to live on, we're going to move mountain, and ensure that Women across the world are in power. Thank you very much.